Our text today is probably um, the most familiar passage of scripture known to man. Um, if you will turn your Bibles to the book of St. John, the third chapter and the 16th verse. Mm. I know many of you can quote this verbatim, don't even need your Bibles. So we will collectively declare this verse together. It'll be a call and response. You repeat after me. When you have it, say amen. amen. I'll begin reading. Repeat after me. For God, For God so, loved so loved the world that he gave, that he gave his, only his only begotten son, begotten son that, whosoever that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For a brief moment, I would like to raise a question that has not yet been answered for your listening ears. Would you just ask your neighbor briefly, say, neighbor, who is the real Santa Claus? That neighbor look, looked a little suspicious. Look at the other neighbor. Turn to him. Say, neighbor, who is the real Santa Claus? You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Who is the real Santa Claus? The Dutch tale of St. Nicholas was that he was a Greek Orthodox bishop who became one of the most popular saints in the Middle Ages. On December 6th, he was, it was named St. Nicholas Day, and it was a day that good children received gifts and bad children got nothing. In Holland, he was known as Sinterklaus due to the shifts in language and the accented verbiage by the change of culture in other words, the Americanized version of Santa Claus is Saint Nicholas or Santa Claus. Uh, Clement Clark Moore, a minister in New York during the year of 1822, created a poem about the Dutch tale of Saint Nicholas and pulled out of his imagination the idea that when Saint Nicholas delivers gifts to good children, he would climb down a tree have friends like Dasher, Dancer, Rudolph, and Jack Frost, but when he finished, he could not look at his creation or his imagination and step back and say, that's good. So I raised the question, if he had never published the poem, would there be a Santa Claus? You may remember the poem because it sounded something like this, "'Twas the night before Christmas, when all through the house, not a creature was stirring, not even a mouse. The stockings were hung by the chimney with care in hopes that St. Nicholas would soon be there. Would there be a Santa Claus if there had not been this poem being published? After three different attempts to create a historical image by three different cultures, including Americans and Europeans, German cartoonist Thomas Nast decided to illustrate his image of Santa Claus as a replica of a rich whisker robber, or in other words, an old European rather large gentleman who steals from the poor to give to the rich. But the general public suggests that that's not who Santa Claus is. In fact, he does the complete opposite of a rich robber. He gives to the poor. He feeds the homeless. He clothes the naked. He acts now as a savior to mankind. It is a fact that with continuous gift giving comes the unwanted expectation of gift reception. Mm. Somebody missed it. In other words, if you give gifts regularly, then the one who receives will begin to expect gifts. If anything happens that seems to be out of the regular, then the gift receiver begins to become confused. Uh, 
I am intrigued by the idea that since the initial meaning of Christmas, which was mass, which means, I'm sorry, mass, which means a Catholic church service centered around Christ, which is where we get the word Christ, mass, has been degraded, I am left to question now, what is Christmas? Some would say that Christ has been lost in Christmas, but, but I pose another question. Has Christ ever totally been the center of Christmas? Or has he just been an addition to Christmas? If Christ is not the focus of Christmas, then I pose my last question. Who is the center of Christmas? How quickly have we forgotten about Santa Claus? I cannot call Santa Claus the focal point of Christmas. I, I, don't, I don't make him the center of Christmas. I don't, I don't hang up my tree and put a Santa Claus on the top of it. I, 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 really, I really don't have my children waiting up at night with cookies and milk, waiting on a savior. And now that we have created him as an idol of worship, Santa Claus, also known as Jesus' replacement, is not the real Santa Claus. St. Nicholas is not the real Santa Claus. St. Nicholas is St. Nicholas. But he is not Santa Claus. Here's one problem. The reason why St. Nicholas a.k.a. Santa Claus, is not the focal point of my Christmas experience uh, or, or the idol of worship. Mm. It's because there are too many inconsistencies for me. First, his name was St. Nicholas. Then his name became Santa Claus. And now his name is Santa Claus. Uh, 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 but, 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 but not only is his name inconsistent, but his image is inconsistent because history tells us that there are children that are looking for him every night, but his image has changed over the years so much that they don't even know what he looks like. First, he was a pagan sorcerer. Secondly, uh, he was a frightening node. Third, uh, he was a drunkard on a turkey-driven sleigh. That's where we get the idea of a sleigh. And fourth, after Thomas Nast created in 1863, what you see today, his image has become too inconsistent. He's way too inconsistent to be worshipped. Because I don't know about you. But my God is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. I'm going to permanently pause here and tell you, uh, I, I'm willing to bet you that within the next two minutes of my sermon, before I get ready to close, I can prove to you that my Santa Claus is better than yours. Number one, if you're writing this down, you, you may want to think about this. Uh, 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 number one, the reason why my Santa Claus is better than yours, uh, uh, you don't get to see your Santa but once a year. Because see, 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 I can talk to my God every day of the year. Mm. Yeah. I, I, I can call him up at any moment, at, at any time of the day. And, and, and my, my God always talks to me because, because he said he never le leave me nor forsake me. Uh, uh, uh. I, I, I don't have to wait in line to talk to him. The, the old folks used to say, uh, uh, Jesus is on the main line. Call him up and tell him. I can't get no help in here. David said in Psalms 91 through 4, Lord, you have been our dwelling place throughout all generations before the mountains were born or you, you brought forth the earth and the world from, from everlasting to everlasting you are God you turn me back to dust saying return to dust O sons of men for a thousand years in your sight or like a day has just gone by or like a watch in the light in the night look at your neighbor and tell him I see him every day Not only can you 
only see your center one time out of the year. Number two, you don't hear people talking about him throughout the year. They only talk about Santa Claus during Christmas time. Oh, but I'm always talking about how good the Lord has been to me. I'm always thinking about the way that he blessed me. I'm, I'm always singing about how good his, his mercy is. I'm, I'm always talking about the grace that he has bestowed. I'm always talking about the love. I'm always talking about his unmerited favor. I, I hear sermons and I, and I sing songs of how good my God has been to me. Because David said in Psalms 145, I will exalt you. My God, the King, I will praise your name forever and never. Every day I will praise you and extol your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. One generation commends your works to another. They tell of your mighty acts. They speak of the glorious splendor of your majesty. And I will meditate mm, on your wonderful works. They tell of the power of your awesome works. And I will proclaim your great deeds. They celebrate your abundant goodness and joyfully sing of your righteousness. Somebody in here shout, I'm always talking about. Not only can you see your Santa, but once a year, do you talk about him once a year? But your Santa, unfortunately, cannot be everywhere at the same time. But my God can be everywhere at the same time. He is omnipresent. There is nowhere he is not. Santa Claus can't get but two on his lap at a time to take a picture. But God can lift everybody on his lap at the same time. I heard an old song say, he's got the whole world in his hands. David says, where can I go? from your spirit where can i flee from your presence if i go up in the heavens you are there if i make my bed in the depths you are there if i rise on the wings of dawn if i settle on the far side of the sea even there your hand will guide me your right hand will hold me fast if i say surely the darkness will hide me and the light become night around me even the darkness will not be dark to you then the night will shine like the day for darkness is as light to you there is nowhere god cannot be I figured this was going to be a real short sermon. Because Because God is everywhere at the same time. And lastly, in closing, ah, everything that Santa Claus gives has a temporary substance, meaning that its value depreciates the moment you open it. Because a temporary God gives temporary gifts. But an eternal God, eh. but an eternal God gives eternal gifts. Do you mind if I build y'all a list real quick? I, I, I don't know about you, but I didn't have to be blessed with a new house. Because he gave me peace of mind. 
For, for, for Isaiah 26 and 3 says, Thou will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusted thee. Matthew 11 and 28, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. God said, I gave you peace. Not only did he give me peace, but he didn't have to give me a new house and a new car because he gave me joy. Joy, joy, joy. Joy, 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 joy. I got joy down in my heart. Now see, joy is an eternal and internal happiness regardless of what the situation or circumstances are around you. Mm. As long as you got joy, in other words, as long as you got Jesus, others, and yourself, everything will be all right. I got joy. Oh, yeah. yeah. Ah. Because James 1, 2, and 3 says, my brethren, Count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. Nehemiah 8 and 10 says, then he said unto them, go your way, eat the fat and drink the sweet and send portions unto them for whom nothing is prepared for. This is the day of holy unto our Lord. Neither be ye sorry for the joy of the Lord is your strength. And I remember the old song that says this joy that I have the world didn't give it to me oh, 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 oh. this joy that I have the world didn't give it to me oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah this joy that I have the world didn't give it to me the world didn't give it and the world can't take it away is there anybody in here that's got joy is there anybody in here that's got joy is there anybody in here that's got peace is there anybody in here that's got love is there anybody in here well will you just lift your voice say thank you lord for the joy is the, the joy of the lord is my strength say yeah I'm almost finished. Not only did he give me peace and joy, but he didn't have to give me that new job because he gave me grace. unmerited favor getting what I don't deserve because there's some stuff that I got from God that I did not deserve to get if it had not been for the Lord on my side where would I be that that's the question second Corinthians 12 and 9 says and he said unto me my grace is sufficient for thee my strength is made perfect in weakness most gladly therefore I will, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me James 4 6 but he giveth more grace wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud but giveth grace unto the humble Ephesians 2 and 8 for by grace are ye saved through faith and not of yourselves it is the gift of God Romans 11 and 6 and if by grace then it is no more of works otherwise grace is no more grace but if it be of works then it is no more grace other works uh, works is no more work grace is a gift from God thank you Lord for your grace Touch your neighbor real quick and just ask him. Say, neighbor, 
who is the real Santa Claus? Now, now, now look at that same neighbor and say, neighbor, do you have an answer? Now watch this. If they did not have an answer, tell them, say, I got one more for you. Because mm. cause, cause he gave me peace. And he keeps on giving it. He, he gave me joy, and he keeps on giving it. He gave me grace and mercy, and he keeps on giving it. He gave me love, and he keeps on giving it. But there's one more thing. Because our text for today says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that, that whosoever believeth, in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Can I tell y'all what the last thing God gave was? Give me a little key right here. Living, he loved me. Dying, he saved me. Buried, he carried my sins far away. Rising, he justified freely forever. One day he's coming back. One day he's coming back. One day he's coming back. Somebody's going to catch this in a minute. One day he's coming back. Oh, glorious day. Oh, glorious day. I don't know about you.